This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human rights issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. We'll resume with our afternoon panel of academic, diplomatic, uh, think tank, political experts to look at some of the issues that we've discussed this morning and at noon. We're very fortunate to have Lincoln Pratson uh, of the Nicholas School of the Environment, uh, one of our own here, who's going to moderate this panel. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lincoln. Thank you, Steve. It's a real honor and privilege to be up here on the same stage with these uh, very esteemed and dynamic panelists. Um, I, uh, our, our job today, our, the, for the next hour and a half, is to try and build on the presentations and discussions of this morning and place the U.S.-Canada um, energy and environment relationship into a broader uh, uh, regional and uh, international context. Um, I, I, as Ambassador Jacobson said, you know, we now cannot talk about energy without also having to talk about the environment. And he went on to um, uh, encourage us to view the e, e challenges as opportunities and approach them in a positive fashion. And I'm, I completely agree. Uh, however, um, any successful approach is going to have to deal with um, realities related to energy security, <coughs> pardon me, as well as politics. And uh, uh, to, to kind of discuss these uh, uh, challenges and, and opportunities, um, I, I want to just briefly introduce you to our panelists in the order that they're going to present and um, the, uh, the, the type of uh, context that they're going to be providing. So uh, again, I feel very thankful and privileged to have these panelists. The first is Amy Jaffe Myers from the Baker Institute and Rice University, who's going to help place the special uh, relationship between U.S. and Canada uh, in the broader context of global energy security and, and energy markets. Um, and then Janet Peace from um, uh, the Pew Climate Center is going to um, kind of uh, convey the importance of um, developing both conventional and alternative uh, resources in a sustainable, environmentally sustainable fashion. And then uh, David Pumphrey from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, who I'm also very proud to say is a Duke alum. Uh, we'll be uh, talking about um, the specific um, economic uh, trade and energy relationships uh, between uh, the United States and Canada. And then finally, we'll end with um, uh, former Ambassador David Wilkins of Nelson Mullins, Riley, and Scarborough. He was the ambassador to Canada under George W. Bush. Um, and he's going to share with us uh, what are some of the political um, state of affairs between the two countries um, on the energy and environment issues and um, his thoughts on uh, how they may be dealt with uh, moving forward. So without any ado, any further ado, I'll turn it over to Amy. Lincoln, uh, thank you very much. So uh, a lot of the heavy lifting uh, for my assignment has uh, been done this morning and so that frees me up to be uh, quick and then put it to uh, the other panelists, uh, some of whose topics haven't really been addressed in depth yet. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the energy security dimension. Uh, and I'll, I have some slides on the environmental dimension, but I feel like a lot of times uh, those two conversations happen separately. In other words, there are people who write about energy security and they write about energy security and there are people who talk about the environment in a manner in which they decide that energy security is actually not important. Um, and, and, and therefore, we really have to have an integrated conversation where we look at the relative emissions of uh, one choice versus another uh, so that when we decide about what we're going to block for environmental reasons, uh, we pick the thing that has the highest amount of emissions and provides the least amount of energy security as a starting point. Uh, and maybe over time we're going to get to a world where we can pick everything that has emissions and take it off the table. Uh, but we don't have the technologies to do that right now. So uh, in doing uh, uh, climate and uh, environmental policy, we probably need to marry it together with trying to 
uh, balance our energy security needs and our environmental needs uh, instead of moving in two separate camps uh, it, as if neither one is actually important depending on which side you're on. Uh, we need to think about it in an integrated way so that we don't wind up um, in a place where we actually don't have energy and people lose their jobs and um, we are not able to move forward as a society with national security um, or a protected economy because we have not made the right choices, uh, not understanding the consequences. Uh, and I see that a lot, and I won't go into that in this talk, but uh, I recommend to the students anyway, I wrote a book a few years ago called Oil Dollars, Debt, and Crises, and the book links together the actual burden of importing a lot of oil uh, from the Middle East and not for some of the energy independence and rhetorical statements that people make, but how it affects our dollar, uh, how it affects our trade balance, uh, how it creates a dumping of, of, uh, uh, of finance onto countries that can't absorb it and then it comes back as a bubble, uh, which then becomes sort of, uh, for those of you in economics, Ponzi finance. So you wind up having this giant speculative money falling into the financial community, and we all kind of know from 2007, 2008, how the story ends. So it's a particularly destabilizing feature to our economy and to uh, uh, the health and well-being of our, our citizens, and it comes into everything. It comes into how much money we have available to pay for environmental protection and environmental science. It comes into all these things through the burden of shifting these billions, hundreds of billions of dollars abroad to pay for the oil. And so I just try to put it in that context, um, because Canada is a country where if we're paying them for energy supply, we don't have to worry about it causing a global financial crisis. Uh, and that's an important element of the U.S.-Canada energy relationship that is, differs from many other of our major suppliers. So uh, with that being said, um, so, so I say that because it's important when you look at this slide, which of course is very visually uh, dramatic because, you know, you're probably, those of you who haven't, like, I guess it's not as surprising now that we've had halfway through the conference, but maybe yesterday, many of you who don't <laughs> sit around and think about how much oil do we actually get from Canada would be surprised to see how large that red pie piece is compared to everything else. Uh, you would probably believe that the Saudi piece is the largest, which of course it's not, and uh, when you look at the green piece about Mexico, uh, please come to the website at the end of the month because the Baker Institute has a new study coming out about the challenge of Mexico's oil sector and the problems they have with their oil production falling 25% over the last five years and whether they're actually going to be able to find the political will and the coalitions to reverse that or not, which is looking pretty, uh, pretty pessimistic. So we have this chunk there in green coming from uh, Mexico, which has a great relationship with us and great relationship with Canada in the, in the NAFTA framework, but uh, they have their own difficulties. Um, and, uh, and then you see the sort of next largest supplier is Iraq. Um, so that's also kind of interesting. You have these uh, two places, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, that uh, uh, we can see having political turmoil. Uh, in, in the current time frame. So um, I'd just like to put Canada in that perspective as to you know, wh what a large supplier they are compared to others, and then also put in the economic perspective that uh, the Canadian economy can, can easily digest the payments we make uh, for energy. Uh, and it doesn't come out into, as like a, a hot money surplus into the financial community, which has a very destructive effect on the global economy. Now, uh, looking out to the future, and to do that, we have our own forecast, but it's simpler. Uh, I think everybody agrees with the International Energy Agency forecast, so that way we don't have to get in a debate about how I made the forecast. And um, if you look at you know, the, the picture to 2030, uh, you, know, you can see that um, almost everything that we are supposedly projecting we're going to use for the increase in demand in oil that's going to come. Uh, despite the president's best efforts at lowering our demand growth, which is definitely going to be successful, there's still a global picture, and the United States is not going down by enough to wipe out that global picture. And so 
uh, these are the volumes in, in green and red that we're so-called expecting um, from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, UAE, Qatar. Uh, and you can see it's uh, quite a lot of oil, and that's quite a big bar. And the only thing else that we have going for us, um, besides that oil, to meet future world oil demand, this is the increase from like everything we're producing today, right, is in this what I call unconventional category. Because as you'll notice with the last box, conventional non-OPEC, uh, that's actually going to decline between now and 2030. So the only thing between us and 100 percent dependence on the Middle East for all future oil supply uh, is unconventional. And so if we cut off unconventional, if we say we're not going to do unconventional, it's too much environmental consequence, we just can't do it, it has too negative an impact on North America to do unconventional. Uh, then what we're really saying is uh, we think we can control events on the ground in the Middle East. And as a person who came to this subject not originally as a technologist but uh, as a Middle East expert, I can tell you that's on an energy security basis, that's an unwise posture. Um, and that is because uh, of what I call the contagion effect. So if I had come to talk to you in 2003, I would, of course, made a lecture about the Terra premium. Maybe you guys remember that from the press. Uh, so now I have to give a lecture about the contagion effect. Um, and the contagion effect is to say, you know, what happened in Egypt, and, and, and I agree with all the analysts, that people are absolutely right. The politics on the ground in Egypt are completely different than every other country in the Middle East. You had a dying president who has no royal legitimacy, who has no secession plan, and he was going to die soon, like really soon, and he had a son he wanted to put to be the next president, and the army generals who effectively run the country didn't want the son. And in the middle of all that, hundreds of young people came out into Tahrir Square, and the guys in the military who were planning to throw Mubarak out anyway said, oh, great coup d'etat, but it won't even look like one because we're just bowing to popular pressure. And that's what they did, and that is why this week in the news, people are back out in Tahrir Square. Because now all of a sudden, the military is not the savior. The military is who they actually are, which is a group of people who intended to have a dictatorship in their power and not in somebody else's power. So now there has to be a renegotiation of the role of the military in society and the role of people in society. And in my opinion, it's not going to be resolved this week. And it might not be resolved this year, right? And, but it had this contagion effect because the visual for everybody in the Middle East was that populations don't have to be silent and people can storm the headquarters of the secret police. And once I see somebody doing that, which is you know, how people felt inspired by Tunisia, once I see anybody doing that, why aren't I doing that? <coughs> um, and so even though, and I, don't have, I only have 10 minutes, so I can't explain to you the politics of why people are unhappy in Saudi Arabia versus the politics of why people are unhappy in Iran versus the politics of why people are unhappy in Syria, but I can tell you that the core issues, which is what is the legitimacy of my government, uh, what kind of political leadership are they providing and what kind of economic development are they providing and how old is the median person in this country and how many people, how, what percentage of that, that population that's young people are unemployed is pretty much the same. I mean, in the sense that it's, it's high. It's all the same variable uh, in terms of how many people are young and unemployed across the region in countries that produce oil. And, um, and you will see political change, in my opinion, in every one of these countries over the next 10 years. Um, and I, I try to remind people that, uh, which we don't remember, uh, because we don't memorize history anymore, uh, which is that the first Egyptian revolution, that was the famous revolution with Gamal Abdel Nasser, happened in 1952. It spread to Iraq. So we think of it as spreading to Iraq, probably, and you're probably guessing in your head, 1953, actually it spread to Iraq in 1959. Syria had the comparable revolution in 1962, 1963. Egypt had a war with Saudi Arabia over what was going to happen in Yemen from 19, I don't know, 58 to 1970. And Gaddafi didn't come in on that same wave of Arab nationalist socialism, Ba'ath Party momentum, until 1969. 
So that's a pretty long period of time of social turmoil and unrest in the Middle East. And it didn't dislodge the Saudi royal family, so maybe that's the good news for US energy supply. Um, but it did have turmoil there for a long time. And it isn't something where we're just going to stop watching CNN in a week when it gets resolved what the Egyptian transition is going to be. Um, because we're going to be seeing all these other countries in the news. And we're going to be seeing Libya in the news for a long time. So, um, so with that in mind and thinking about um, this chart I showed you with the Middle East and thinking about the political backdrop of the Middle East, um, then we have to look at um, we want, we, there, I think we're, everybody's on the same page as wanting to uh, eliminate fossil fuel emissions. And so the question is, what is the scale of, of fossil fuel, uh, of, of carbon emissions that comes from producing the oil sands? And how does that compare to, say, burning coal, right, or using petroleum in the United States, or using gasoline? Uh, and you guys can see the, the the levels of difference here, uh, and the level of difference is quite large. Uh, the extensive emissions that comes from burning coal or burning gasoline um, are uh, ten times, nine, eight or nine, ten times higher than the emissions that comes from producing the tar sands. Uh, but when we speak about it in public policy debate, there is a disproportionate focus on the carbon emissions from oil sands is if that is what's really going to tilt the planet, uh, you know, over to, you know, this three degree rise or six degree rise, uh, when in the end, uh, our use of, of our cars and our use of coal for generating all electricity, when we possibly could have alternative technologies, is actually a much, much, much bigger part of the problem. And so I don't want to say that Canada shouldn't make improvements uh, in the carbon footprint of their resource development. And obviously the water problem is a different kind of problem. Um, but I do believe there's this lack of proportionality in the debate today when people get into hysteria over Keystone. There is just this lack of proportionality to the scale of the carbon emissions problem with this resource versus the scale of other carbon emissions problems, which we don't protest about at all. Uh, and I, we just had a forum at the Baker Institute last week about the Japanese nuclear crisis. Um, and we had a lot of nuclear scientists and medical people there. And, you know, I mentioned to the audience that there is radioactive waste from the burning of coal. And it's actually probably even higher than the radioactive waste, or it's comparable to the radioactive waste that would happen to you if you were 20 miles away from this Fukushima plant. But people are in a panic buying iodine pills in Vancouver over the Fukushima plant but they're probably living down the street from a coal plant and they never worry about that pollution at all. And so I think that it behooves you, especially you students of the generation at Duke, to really become informed in thinking about what is the environmental risk of A versus B, because in the end, unless everybody's willing to sit in the dark and not drive their car, we have to use something, which everybody made that point this morning. Um, so again, um, just to put it in perspective, to, um, you know, to, to let you look at U.S. emissions and where it comes from, um, here, is, uh, here is just a more uh, pictaneous uh, thing. Uh, you probably, none of you realize that cement production is, is uh, you know, 3%. Uh, that dwarfs uh, the oil sands, just the production of cement dwarfs the oil sands. None of you are having meetings here at Duke about whether or not we should stop or change the kind of production we use in cement. Uh, nobody even debates that in the environmental community. So again, like I say, I'm not saying that we shouldn't you know, press Canada to come up with more environmentally friendly ways to produce the oil sands. Anybody who makes a contribution, it's a good thing. But again, we have to understand uh, uh, the percentages and you know, solid fuels is coal. And if you look at the difference between pictorially, and I showed you the statistic on the other slide, but if you just visually look at the you know, cookie cut here of liquid fuels, which is you're driving around in your car, and coal, which you are using when you flick your light switch, even though it seems invisible, uh, that's a much bigger problem. And then uh, you know, to just put it pictorially, like if you're going to choose a fuel, and you're thinking about U.S. emissions in general, and we were going to address this through fuel choice. 
Um, you know, you can see the differentiation between natural gas uh, and the other two fuels. So I leave that with you as my final comment. Thank you for um, being here today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk to you about this issue. Um, I'm from the Pew Center on Global Climate Change, and as you might guess, we focus on climate. Um, I want to spend just two minutes and tell you a little bit about my organization so you know where my perspective on this issue is coming from. Um, at Pew, we do basically three things. We spend a lot of time on research. We have lots of publications on our website that look at everything from the economics, um, alternative energy, looking at technology, um, the science of a changing climate, how do we deal with impacts and adaptation. So we spend a lot of time on research, looking at all these aspects. We also spend a lot of time working with companies. Um, we have a, a business council that we run our research through. We get comments. We try to learn from them about what works, what doesn't work. You can see from these logos, it's a pretty broad spectrum of companies. Um, and these are big guys. A lot of them are big emitters, or they have products that result in big emissions. Um, we don't always agree, but we try to learn, and we hope they learn a little bit from us. To be on our council, you have to agree that the science is good enough. You have to agree that you think mandatory regulation is the right approach. You have to agree that internationally, we got to do something about this. So, I mean, we, uh, we expect these companies to be taking actions themselves, and they are. I think in the, the scheme of the political situation at this point, a real um, positive element is what the companies are doing, because they are doing a lot. So just a... Um, I guess uh, so. We do. We work with companies. We work. We spend a lot of time on research. And the third thing we do is we spend a lot of time with policymakers. And we work on the international level. We work at the state, and we work um, with folks in in the um, federal government as well. Um, we, we we take all the stuff that we research, and we take all the comments from the companies, and we try to 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 provide insight and harmony between what each folk each different camp is is working on. Um, where are we with climate policy? Does anybody not know? Um, we're, we're not very far along. We have a, uh, we had a, a very serious conversation about it over the last few years. We have a president who's absolutely committed to dealing with climate. But, you know, we, we had a lot of things go on in the last few years that kept us from, from really moving on climate legislation in the U.S. And first and foremost, you know, the American public is really not totally bought into this topic. And there was a, I would say, a concerted com campaign of misinformation, a well-funded campaign of misinformation that confuse the topic, and, and that was part of the issue, certainly, and we're seeing uh, new polls that talk about a resurgence of, of support in the American public. Um, I, I would argue that the biggest thing that kept us from moving legislation in the last couple years was the economy. You know, it's, it's hard to, when people are focused on their job and whether or not they're going to have income to pay their mortgage, it's hard for them to think about a long-term environmental issue that has implications that we can just, you know, think about in 5, 10, 20 years. So there's, there was a lot of issues that, that kept us from moving. Um, and, and right now we, we have elections that are again on the horizon. And I would say that, you know, the, the chances of us getting legislation in this year, none. Next year, hmm. Um, it could be several more years before we actually get back to this topic in a meaningful way. And I, and I, I think when we do, we'll look at it in a different way, probably in, in the lens of energy and energy policy. So what's the, the consequences of, of legislative inaction? Well, let me, let me just assure you that it's not, it's not that nothing is going on. There are a lot of things that are, res, that are, are still bubbling through. Um, EPA, for example, has been directed by the Supreme Court to regulate CO2. Um, so they're, they're doing that. Um, it's not optimal. Absolutely not optimal, and, and EPA would be the first to tell you that regulating CO2 through, CO2 through the Clean Air Act is, is not the, the best, nor most cost-effective, probably nor most effective means of getting us to where we need to go on, on climate. Um, but they are moving forward on that. They've put several rules out there. Um, we also have state and regional programs that are still moving forward. You know, granted that the, the, the states are not immune to the political winds, and so we have seen a few states going, oh, well, maybe we don't really want to push too hard on that today. 
But, but nevertheless, we have, still have a number of states who have climate policies either started, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast, for example, has a, a uh, cap and trade program on electricity. Um, we still see California moving forward. We still see the Western Climate Initiative moving forward. Um, there's still common law nuisance suits working their way through the courts. Uh, AEP versus Connecticut, I believe, is supposed to be heard. Um, the Supreme Court, the, I, the oral arguments are April 19th. Um, SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, has guidance out for um, the materiality of climate policy and climate impacts. And the uh, National Environmental Policy Act requires that you consider climate change. And we see that with the, the pipeline, especially at this point. Um, so that's not to say that, that all of this is perfect, but the point is that there is a lot going on. It's not national. It's, I mean, there's not a climate bill percolating through the uh, Congress at this point, but um, there certainly is still movement on the climate issue. Uh, in our perspective, of course, a congressional solution is the best, but it's not likely in the near term. So, so having said that, we still have a president, as I said, who's totally committed to clean energy. I mean, every speech he talks about clean energy, he talks about climate. Um, and so is, is, is a clean energy pathway, a clean energy policy consistent with the oil sands? So that's, I would say it absolutely depends because clearly there are energy security benefits. There's no doubt, none at all, that there are energy security benefits of having our nearest neighbor, one that we have a close relationship, develop more energy and, and us using that. I think there is, is no doubt about the national security benefits, the energy security benefits. But as, as you've heard you know, through the whole day, there are implications, environmental implications of, of that source. Um, specifically, there are more greenhouse gas emissions. And you're gonna see, depending on who you talk to, different estimates of what that, that difference is. At the Pew Center, we like to say the difference on a life cycle basis between conventional oil and um, oil sands is about 13 to 26% higher. Again, that depends on what, which facility you're looking at. It depends on what you're counting. Because as, as, as Amy rightly said, 80% of the emissions that come from this source of energy come in the use of it. So when we drive our cars, 80% comes from our use, but that leaves the other 20%. So you're gonna see numbers, you'll, you'll see other, um, you know, other environmental groups out there who will say um, the emissions are 85% higher. I think that's what the New York Times said last weekend, 85% higher. Um, I have seen estimates that say it's three times higher. Well, it depends what you're looking at and what you're counting. If you're just looking at the whole life cycle, 13 to 26%, but if you're looking at the extraction, if you're looking at the difference between extraction of, of oil sands versus conventional, 85% to three times higher, depending on which facility you're looking at and what particular point in time. Um, but from our perspective, the importance is the life cycle. The importance is considering that the biggest chunk of this is in our use of that as we drive our cars, heat our homes, et cetera. Um, but but that, doesn't dis that doesn't dismiss the fact that there's, there's more at the extraction point. Um, and if you're trying to focus on how to deal with that increase, you're going to look at the extraction. And there are th some things that are, um, have been, you know, discussed. Maybe we can put nuclear. I mean, right now the oil sands are um, fueled by natural gas. I mean, it could, could be worse. They could be fueled by coking coal. Um, I would suspect that Alberta's um, climate program at $15 keeps the coking coal out of the mix. And, Probably the, uh, the price of natural gas is doing a better job, actually, than the Alberta program at keeping natural gas as the fuel of choice. But um, certainly, if you could put nuclear, micro-nuclear, you would eliminate a significant portion of the extraction emissions. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be dealing with 80%, which is the, the largest chunk of the emissions, but you would be dealing with the, um, the extraction emissions. Um, there's also um, the... The Alberta government has spent a lot of money on CCS and investing in carbon capture and storage. Um, if that could be made to work, certainly the emissions at the extraction side would be better. And, and it's important that they continue to look at that because I don't think that the oil sands are going to go away. I don't think that we're not going to produce the oil out of the oil sands. So 
13 to 26 percent doesn't sound nearly as bad as saying, oh, geez, they're 85 percent higher or three times higher. But if you consider that we need to get to 80 percent below our 2050, 80 percent below by 2050, a 13 to 26 percent takes us in the wrong direction. And we probably need to figure out how to deal with that. Um, but the, the climate impact of the oil sands, I would argue, is, is not the most important. Well, I mean, even though I'm, I deal with climate all the time, for me, climate is the most important. But for the other environmental groups out there, and I wish there were others on this panel, because um, I deal with climate, and I typically just deal with climate. But the other environmental communities are, that are out there really opposing the oil sands, they're not, I mean, they, they use climate. And I would, I would argue that climate is really a stand-in issue for all of these other issues. Um, I mean, the, the, um, when you think about the oil sands, the, the deposit, the bitumen deposit is, you know, the size of Florida. It's huge. Now, of course, that's not all being mined, but it's, it's a big deposit. It's a big, it's a big deal. And how you get to that is open pit mining. Right now, about 50% of the, the oil sands are mined through strip mining. And um, that leaves a huge scar. As I understand it, you can see the, the uh, oil sands operations from the moon. It's not insignificant when you talk about land disturbance. And some of that land is pretty sensitive. Well, I guess all of it is very sensitive habitat. Um, there's wildlife. There's um, the boreal forest is a significant carbon sink. Um, other folks have mentioned the water issue. For every barrel of oil that's produced, two to four barrels of fresh water in addition to what's recycled, and a significant amount is recycled. But two to four barrels of new is used for every barrel. And really, um, I, think, I think one of our presenters this morning said, well, it's like a manufacturing facility. The, the uh, oil sands really are more like a manufacturing industrial facility. And like any industrial facility, there are smokestacks. And the smokestacks, the air pollution that comes from those smokestacks, they, imp they, they impact downwind people. And the, uh, the folks here are Aboriginal. They're not very many. But certainly, there are impacts from having these smokestacks and these air emissions. Um, the toxics here, um, those come from the ponds. So that right now, there's about 65 square miles of these ponds that are in existence. I, I believe. Um, that some folks have referred to those as heritage ponds, and there, there are 65 square miles. That's big. And these are um, open to wildlife, and uh, they kill ducks. I, I know that uh, you know, there's a, a lot of birds killed in other places, but, but with the oil sands, you have these open, open pits. Um, I've got these last two things, renewable energy and energy conservation, on here, because again, I, I think that the oil sands are standing for, they, they represent a continued reliance on fossil fuels. So to many people, it's like, oh, we're, we're going to have these oil sands. Well, we really need to be getting away from fossil fuels as opposed to creating new resources. Well, I completely agree that we need to be pushing more on the renewable energy. We need to be pushing more on energy efficiency because we do need to be moving our economy to a lower carbon economy. However, I, I also am an economist, and I do know that as long as economics work in the right direction, these oil sands are going to be produced. I have no doubt about that. But to that end, they need to be produced in a responsible manner. And, and that's not to say that, that nothing is being done. Um, I think we've heard this morning that, you know, Alberta government, there's a lot of um, effort. There's the, the, the ponds have actually are all lined. They're, they're not just open pit that aren't lined. The, the ponds are all lined. Um, and there is an effort to, to try to get the, the solids to settle more thoroughly and eventually to move away from the ponds. Um, Reclamation is currently happening, but it's happening at a very slow, slow, slow pace. Um, so there are a lot of things being done, but there is a long way to go on this issue. Um, a little picture of the moonscape that is Fort McMurray. Um, all of these environmental impacts, except for climate and migratory birds, are happening. Those are, are Canadian issues. When you talk about US implications of, of you know, implications, environmental implications, it's really about the pipeline. And what people are talking about is really the potential for leaks. The, um, you can see the, the pipelines go, um, the, the Keystone XL pipeline 
goes through the, or over top of the Ogallala Aquifer. And, uh, you know, the common concern is this is a, a shallow aquifer. So what if, you know, if you have a big leak, wouldn't that, you know, really damage the water table? Um, and, and truthfully, I mean, what's, what's being, what's in these pipes is not traditional petroleum. It's bitumen. And bitumen is more corrosive. Um, it, it has to be moved at a higher temperature. But what's in these pipes is not pure bitumen. It's, all, it's a diluted bitumen. And I don't know whether it's more corrosive, but I would argue that if it is more corrosive, we certainly should have different standards for those pipelines. We should know that. And I, I don't know personally, but I would assume that our federal government is part of the EIA. Part of the requirement is to assess this. Is it more corrosive? Do we need different standards? And I'm sure that is being looked at. Um, because if it, all pipelines need to be safe. We need to have a certain level of safety assurance as well as response. But you know, our country is really covered by a lot of pipelines. And um, I guess I would personally prefer to have a new pipeline in my backyard than an old pipeline, because new pipelines tend to be a little safer than old pipelines. Um, but, but certainly we need to deal with whether or not it's more corrosive, absolutely. And if it is, the standards need to be different. You know, all of our energy sources have risk. Over the last few years, we have seen, you know, coal mine collapse and people have died. We've seen natural gas explosions in California from, um, you know, a pipeline that failed. Um, and now we've got a nuclear disaster in Japan. They all have risk. Our energy comes with risk, and we need to make choices about the level of risk that we're, we're um, that's, that's acceptable to us. Um, but we're not going to live without energy. So we have to assess those risks and make our choices accordingly. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers for inviting me to have the opportunity to come back to uh, campus. Um, it's interesting. I was actually here twice in a week's time because I came for a reunion weekend um, as well. And it's uh, very interesting. I, I finally feel oriented when I could get to see the chapel, because when I look around the rest of the campus, I'm sort of totally disoriented, especially on this side, which was all woods while I was here. So it is an amazing thing to see. And what I was hearing about the beginnings of this integrated energy program is also something that I think is very important to, to take on. And so I look forward to hearing more about that, though I think there was a thing about asking for money. I'm not sure I like that idea. There, I, you get enough of, believe me, when you graduate, you get enough of those uh, as time goes along. Um, I was going to talk a little bit, and I'm covering many things that I think have been covered before. It's always a problem that the last two speakers will have is that most of the facts have been entered into the record, if you will. And so I, I will be going through some of those again, so maybe this is the review, review time before you have your quiz on the, on the panel. Um, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, we're an international uh, security think tank dating from the 60s. And in the beginning, it was very much a Cold War-focused um, uh, organization, which had to change in, in the 90s, or else it became less relevant. And we've expanded into many other dimensions of international security issues, with energy security being one of the, the most important ones. And that program itself has evolved over time. So I, it, before I joined uh, four years ago, it was really dealing with what I would call traditional energy security issues, some of the, that you've heard today in terms of oil supply, oil um, production in the Middle East, uh, issues like that. We've taken the program now to continue that work, but also to look at the energy challenges being put forward by climate change, because we, we view climate change also as a security threat for, for the future, and designing energy policies means you have to take that into account. Um, at CSIS, they did a major uh, program a few years ago called Smart, smart Power, so we label everything as something smart. Uh, so smart energy policy is what we're hoping for, though I sometimes give up hope on getting to that point in time. First, reviewing the trading relationship in terms of energy between the U.S. and Canada. You've heard many times that this is the biggest energy trading relationship, and I think this is just an effort to kind of put some numbers to, or a summary of the numbers that you've been hearing about. Electricity flows both directions, and I'll talk, I'll talk in, on all three of these areas in more detail as we go forward. Um, that's about a $3 billion enterprise We total up the trade both directions. Uh, petroleum flows mostly north to south, though there's a little bit um, that goes uh, in the reverse direction for uh, business reasons. Um, 
Today's prices, that's probably close to a $100 billion enterprise in terms of the flow of oil. Natural gas um, is very interesting because it has traditionally flowed very much north to south with a little bit flowing north. We're beginning to see that arrow on the right uh, widen, if you will. These arrows obviously aren't in proportion. They're dictated by the font in the middle. But um, still, <laughs> the, um, uh, beginning to see some flows going north that uh, have implications, I think, for this relationship. But this is a, I think I estimated about a $16 billion uh, relationship. So you're talking nearly $120 $125 billion trading relationship in today's price terms. So that's a $100 price of oil, but only a $4 price for gas. So you've had all of this uh, uh, balancing out. So if we look first at the economic um, importance of this energy trade, and I, I took chose the uh, importance to the Canadian economy because I think in many ways this is really a dominant uh, issue in Canada. Um, if you look at uh, 2010, about $93 billion in exports in terms of the, what was in the statistics, primarily oil and gas, 23% uh, of total exports come from, uh, from energy-related exports. So you can see as a, a piece of the economy, this is really important. And for the G, uh, GDP, it's about 7% of, of GDP. So again, energy is fundamental. And direct employment, about 263,000 people. So that's on the Canadian side. Now, the US side is much harder to measure. There are a lot of numbers that float out there. I decided not to get too much into that because most of the ones I found came from advocacy groups. And so I felt like uh, that makes it a little more uh, difficult. There was one, though, that was distributed a survey uh, that was put out, that was being put out by the Canadian um, Association of uh, uh, Petroleum Producers, CAP probably an advocacy organization, but they did it on the basis of a survey that for the oil sands operation alone, there's almost a thousand companies, U.S. companies involved in supplying goods and services to this operation. And so there is a much wider network of benefits to the U.S. economy that come from the fact that this market is very integrated. So you're seeing the flows of oil, you're seeing the flows of dollars both directions. And so this is an important piece of the North American economy. Now, moving into, uh, I think this is a similar pie chart to the one Amy had. I broke it down a little further. She used better colors than I did. So uh, you can see the, the Canada wedge. Um, and looking at, in terms of uh, import sources for the U.S., I won't run through, all, through this completely. 22% uh, of U.S. oil imports, um, oil, that's crude and uh, products coming from Canada. Uh, in natural gas, essentially about nearly 90% of our imports are coming from, from Canada. A little bit of LNG that is coming in Trinidad, a whole bunch of other countries coming in by ship. Um, it's about 15% of total uh, U.S. demand. In this case, it's measuring against demand, not against um, uh, imports. In the case of the oil, you probably about 11% Canadian oil, 11% of our total consumption of oil comes from Canadian um, oil products. Electricity changes, exchanges are um, much smaller, and so it's really in the 1% to 2% range of total U.S. electricity consumption, but it really matters on regional basis. And you're seeing it come, as we heard uh, earlier, quite a bit from Quebec as a major export base, but you're seeing um, in uh, British Columbia, there's actually a flow going north. And so weather conditions and other things make a huge difference in terms of which direction electricity flows. But I think that, for me, the most important point here, it, in the Washington political debate and through the, uh, the language that has developed from the 1970s, we focused ourselves around saying, well, how much do we import and from whom, as if that really mattered in terms of the way the, the oil market operates. If our concern, as David Goldwyn said, is price insecurity, in many ways having a real shortage of oil has happened very few times, and it takes major disruptions for that happen. And even when that does happen, what you see are radically higher prices affecting the economy. It really matters what goes on in the global system. And so it always bothers me to hear the debate put in terms of, well, what is it that we're doing as if we could in some way insulate ourselves from the effects of a disruption in the marketplace? So we could take ourselves down to very small levels of import, but the working of a globalized market means we would feel the price effects uh, irrespective of wh what our level of imports were. This is sort of the representation of looking at Canada in terms of what are the needs for global um, supply security. And the chart on the left is one we use often to talk about measuring what we'll need for future investments in oil in the international market, not against what we think 
the incremental demand will be because the, the current uh, production levels are not a static number. Oil production and gas production, all of those uh, types of uh, commodities go into decline almost as soon as they're put into production. So you have to continually be replacing for declining production. And so on this, on this chart, sometimes it's a different color, that's why I wanted to look. The big blue wedge there is the additional oil production capacity we're gonna need over time to replace uh, the decline at, if that decline rate across the industry globally is about 4%. If it's up at higher numbers at 7%, and some people are saying that we're going to be seeing it at that level, you get into that gray area. Effectively, what you have to do over the next 20 years is turn over the oil supply system for the world. So you're having to replace, when you take account of the small wedge at the top, uh, which is the growth in demand, and the two other wedges, potentially having to replace 60 to 90 million barrels per day of oil production capacity. That really leads to the issue about where is it going to come from. Amy used the IEA uh, projections of where will additional increases come from, which I think is one way, actually, I've used in other presentations. But I think in this case, it's important to look at where is the oil. The oil, the, the oil of the future is going to come from where we know the reserves are now. And if you look across this uh, chart, and it, there was a reference by the ambassador this morning to this chart that went further down, I used only the top 10 countries in terms of proved in oil reserves, it represents about 80% of total global oil reserves. And you can see that Canada is the only country on that list that really has an open investment system, an open trading system, uh, where the uh, market-driven decisions on production levels in the future will dominate. All the other countries on this list, to one degree or another, are run by decisions that are made at the state, um, at the state level, by the government level. And the, the decisions made in those countries may be different and likely, and the interests that they have likely are different than the interests of oil consumers around the world. So having a Canadian supply, and this is the 174 number, I didn't even take it up. And, and by the way, this was a statistic that had Venezuela being number two. Um, uh, there's, there are a lot of games that go on by countries having to feel like, well, I need to move up, so I will revise my numbers upwards, even if they haven't discovered any more oil. So we've seen some of that with Iraq and Iran recently as well. But um, having Venezuela, Canada in that range uh, provides a, an assurance of at least having one source that will be developed according to the principles that markets will, will drive through. In addition, the countries that are in that list are ones where we're really seeing the insecurities in the supply chain. So we saw in Libya the potential for production uh, disruptions. You saw in Egypt the potential for disruption in the flow of oil coming through the, the Suez Canal and the Sumed pipeline as we were reminders that this whole supply chain has issues. It's not just at the production source, it's through the whole chain. Just uh, one map um, which I could have replicated for uh, oil, uh, gas, and electricity, but I thought it was important, uh, and it's a very important way of thinking about what this market is all about, which is that this market in North America is highly interconnected and highly integrated together. And you can see the, the flow of um, the pipeline system into the basic U.S. pipeline system. There's very little um, Canadian oil that comes through tankers. It comes through fixed transportation um, systems, which really put it into a different category. And Janet mentioned this as well in terms of environmental impacts, but also in the interests of those who are uh, both producing and shipping, as well as the ability for that oil to be diverted. Tankers can go other places, and they do that that all the time. I mentioned giving a little bit more detail on the uh, trading relationship, and I think this helps to look at how electricity trade has um, evolved since uh, 1980 and the differences that can come from the fact that these are exchanges um, and in the past had been ex more of an exchange-based relationship rather than an export and trade relationship. The red line at the bottom reflects uh, Canadian exports of, and sales into the U.S., and the blue line on the top are U.S. sales into Canada. And you can see the variability. The green line is the net sales position. So in 1990, basically, it was a balanced system. So I, I went to an electricity expert I know and was asking about that, and he says, it's the weather. Um, when you think about the hydro system in uh, Canada, if it's dry, uh, you're going to have less uh, electricity available for export. 
and uh, when it's wet, you're going to have it available to be sold, and, and it'll spike. But I think if you look at the, the later years, you're seeing actually growth in trade in both directions, which is a very interesting phenomenon. We heard a little bit of Quebec's, Hydro-Quebec's plans to build greater in connections, interconnections to allow the sales into the U.S., but you're seeing sales from the U.S. into, into Canada. Across Canada, about 40% of the exports come out of Quebec, about 25% out of Ontario, and 20% out of Manitoba. So that's the north-south direction. And recently, the uh, south-north has been about 50% of it's gone into BC, which I assume has been a uh, water availability problem. So I'll spend uh, the most time uh, talking a little bit on uh, the more what I would call traditional concept of trade, which is sales from one country into another country, and you have the commodities available for sale. And I put this headline on here because it reflects, um, I guess, a piece of work that I did in my 30 years of service in the federal government was to participate in the uh, U.S.-Canada trade negotiations and the work that we did around establishing some rules between the two countries to reflect the importance of uh, energy trade. During my time at, at DOE, I um, actually was involved in Canadian issues from about 1980 on, so I saw most of this whole time frame kind of on a real-time basis. And you see what I put as the early period of time, of a period of time of high government intervention in the markets, energy markets in both countries. We had price controls in the United States, uh, Canada, towards the end of that period, was moving into a nationalistic policy in term, on the National Energy Plan that they implemented. We moved to a position of actually thinking that governments could set a border price for natural gas trade and negotiate that price between the two countries. And what you saw then was from the early 70s up until about 1980 or 81, a real decline in the volume of trade between the two countries. You're having underlying changes too in terms of the consumption. But this um, involvement of governments trying to decide what trade should be, how markets should run, really uh, caused, uh, kept us from realizing the benefits. In the early 80s, we went through a period in both countries where we recognized that governments couldn't control um, energy markets and, and freed up prices, um, freed up investment. And in the late 80s, engaged in this, the idea of a free trade agreement. And when we entered into those negotiations, the question is, what should, we know energy trade is important. What, what should we do about this? What do we need to do? And we realized the most important thing that we could do as negotiators and get accepted into the agreement was to try to take away the thing you heard about this morning, which is the uncertainty of government intervention in the trade. And that um, agreement includes some pretty important uh, measures that both countries agreed to to limit their abilities and the scope for which they would um, not interfere with the trade. From the U.S. perspective, everyone was worried that under trading rules, the GATT trading rules, you had a very open exception to say, well, my energy security says I should do X, Y, and Z. And we had used that to limit oil imports um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. And so we'd said that was national security, and it's really not challengeable in the trading system. On the Canadian side, the issue was, well, we need to preserve our natural resources, so we're going to put limits on how much can be exported. So we, in effect, put limits on the, the degree to which, between our two countries, you could utilize those two provisions in the trading rules. So basically self-imposed uh, limits on doing that. And the U.S. said, well, for energy security purposes, we'll only limit that to what's necessary for defense, so defense sales. We can take some action there. And Canada took on a, uh, a policy which was quite controversial, which has said if we decide to cut back on the oil production, or gas production in our system, we're going to cut back Canadian consumers as much as we cut back U.S. consumers. It's got to be proportional throughout. And uh, there was some resistance we got to that, but I think we got the idea across that governments need to be letting the market make these, these choices. This was followed up later by um, an energy law in the U.S. that said, well, if we've established this free trade agreement, which has these rules, we're going to basically tell our natural gas regulators that in the case of a, a proposal they get, an approval that they have to make on natural gas exports or imports from uh, Canada or another, it got expanded to Mexico with NAFTA, we're going to have you, we have made the presumption that it's in the national interest, which as David had mentioned earlier, becomes one of the judgments that has to be made. And basically reduce that whole regulatory role for government to one of 
uh, receiving the application, putting a stamp on it, and sending it back approved. Now, you could, of course, do away with the office because I guess you can't do away with those kinds of offices. But still, they basically had to turn them around as quick as possible. And as I was thinking about this um, coming up, and this gets back to the Keystone consideration, I realized that we weren't smart enough to recognize that the lingering and rarely used presidential permit authority, which I have not actually been able to look through, and David can help me, I'm sure, at some point, where the authority derived from the president being able to issue this permit. The best I can see is it was taken out of a generic authority for the president in international affairs, and I haven't found a comparable authority in Canada or, or Mexico for the trade on those bases. So we weren't smart enough to figure out someday in the future this could be used as a political tool rather than one that provided for uh, regular oversight of the national, national security and national defense, which basically is the national interest statement that's been followed. So if you look at what goes on in this presidential permit process, it is basically another layer in the regulatory process for looking at things that are then looked at further downstream. So the issue that Janet was mentioning in terms of pipeline safety is one that comes along at other points in the process to be examined. But instead, we've now had this uh, tool that's been used because, um, at least in my assessment, which I think is very similar to Janet's, the uh, climate community has recognized that they've lost the fight at the national level, and they need to fight a, a guerrilla warfare, if you will, to try to look at projects and apply different standards in, um, in this case than would have been applied into an American project. So I think there is scope for, again, allowing uh, more certainty to come into the marketplace, that governments can uh, clarify what their positions are in these issues, and I think that would be a, an important step forward. And I, probably the most, the last point I would leave, and just to reiterate some comments David and others were making, is that this is a trading relationship between countries that have very similar values, very similar processes. This is not a relationship between a country where they're using, uh, there are no environmental standards, where there is a kleptocracy in terms of the money, the money is not being circulated back. These are countries where you have very positive value systems, and I think we need to move forward to, again, reassure the system that we have an integrated market and that we can pretend that there's not really a border in terms of energy trade. Thank you. First, my deepest thanks to the Duke's Center for Canadian Studies. I've spent the last six years of my life, I think, touting the critical importance of the U.S.-Canada relationship. Uh, I believe Canada is our most important world partner. Uh, for a number of reasons, trade, security, energy, and others. So what we're doing here today, I believe, is very valuable. Uh, as we watch the events in an unstable world, it becomes even more important, uh, more evident, uh, how very much we need to educate Americans on the many ties that bind us to Canada, uh, and that Canada needs to be an integral part of our energy security. I often say that um, Canadians think they know everything they to know about Americans. And you don't. Uh, Americans think they know enough about Canadians, uh, and we don't. Uh, and so conferences like this are very vitally important uh, to both countries. Uh, with Americans now paying close to $4 or more uh, in some parts of the country for gas and the Middle East in turmoil, there could not be a more relevant time for Americans to be focused on the economic, environmental, and security advantages of importing Canadian oil. And I'm delighted we were able to hear from my friend U.S. Ambassador, current U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Jacobson, this morning. He has one of the greatest jobs in the world. And it was my privilege, really the privilege of a lifetime, for me to serve in that capacity for almost four years. But he has a little advantage over me. He's from Chicago. I'm a boy from the South. And so when I appeared in, in Canada in 05 with my wife, Susan, we were very excited about getting to enjoy our first white Christmas. And uh, we invited our sons up and their families, and we had a glorious time playing in the snow and doing the sleigh rides. And I know Canadians can uh, relate to this. I must confess that I did not anticipate enjoying my first white Easter, my, <laughs> my first white Memorial Day. And I always said if I ever enjoyed my first white July 4th, I was out of there. And that, uh, thankfully, love, that never happened. But the first day on the job, 
I went to a diplomatic reception and I ran into the Greek ambassador and ambassadors always say, so how long have you been here? So I go up to him and say, how long have you been in Ottawa? He says, five winters. I say, how long is that? He said, a very long time. <laughs> I, uh, I was the uh, veteran of four Ottawa winters. So I do appreciate being back down south. And it's a privilege to chat here with all of you in North Carolina at this wonderful university because we speak the same language. When we got to uh, Canada, we began making friends and we would tell everybody about South Carolina and the wonderful attributes of our, of our beautiful state, the coastline, the mountains, uh, the, the beautiful history of Charleston. We'd tell them about shrimp and grits and about boiled peanuts. And then we'd tell them how much we loved to shag and that it was the official state dance of South Carolina. And we'd tell them we'd love to shag everywhere in the state. And we'd, we'd do it for hours. We'd even switch partners. We did it different ways. You can imagine our surprise when the wife of the Irish ambassador one evening pulled Susan aside and explained to her that the word shag had an entirely different meaning uh, in other parts of the world. We never used that word again, but we sure were invited to a lot of parties right after that. Um, <laughs> Now, while I do love to share that silly story, uh, our partnership with Canada is a very, very serious business. Uh, it's a relationship, has been said many times already today, built on mutual history, a shared commitment to human rights and democracy, and a world-class trade relationship that truly is the envy of the world. Now, I'm in a room full of experts on energy today. I'm not one of those. Uh, but I will attempt to give you a little perspective on the current political realities of the day in Canada and the United States. You already know by now that Canada is our number one foreign supplier of energy, has been said many times, and that reality alone is very important to the peace and prosperity of our country. To overstate the obvious, the bottom line is this, America needs oil, period, and we will need it for a long time to come. Uh, I'm privileged to serve as chairman of the Board of Trustees of my alma mater, Clemson University, not too far down the road from you. And like scholars here at Duke, Clemson is actively involved in studying energy and the environment. And last year, we broke ground on what will be the world's largest wind turbine drivetrain testing facility in Charleston, South Carolina. So I have a deep appreciation of the study for alternative energy resources. But while it may be an admirable goal to envision a world fueled by wind and solar and renewable energy, it certainly is not a realistic one anytime soon. Experts predict that even 25 years from now, oil and natural gas will still be meeting half or more of the U.S. energy needs. Now, I was an elected official for 25 times on the ballot some 13 times before I became a diplomat, and so while I may not have a, a, a level of depth of understanding that many of you do on environmental issues. I know a little bit about politics. But when we talk about importing Canadian oil, it's a marriage of both smart environmental policies and even smarter politics. And I think that's why last month, President Obama, in making a call for decreased dependency on foreign oil, rightly singled out and pointed out that imports from Canada should continue. There are many reasons, environmentally and politically, that I believe we should do all we can to promote and facilitate our energy trade with Canada. Water and air are not restrained by man-made borders, so Canada and U.S. have the same environmental concerns. And on many fronts, Canada is in advance of the United States. Oil sands crude comes from Alberta, and it was the first jurisdiction in North America to implement greenhouse gas regulations. So there's no other nation we deal with, and you've seen the list, where we get our oil from that is more strident about leaving a clean environmental legacy and reducing greenhouse gas emissions than our friend and neighbor, Canada. And there's little downside with openly and actively dealing with our best trading partner. We never have to worry about political unrest or upheaval in Canada, even though you do have question period, uh, or what it means, or what that means in terms of oil exports to us. 
a concern we have with nearly every other country that we receive oil from. So what can we expect realistically in both countries on the energy slash environmental front in 2011 and 2012? Right now, Canada is in the midst of a federal election to be held on May 2nd. Most pundits predict the Conservatives under Prime Minister Harper will be re-elected. The question is whether or not he'll be re-elected with a minority or majority government. Uh, but they certainly are in election mode as we speak. And the Prime Minister, he was elected in February of 06 when I was in Canada. He has been criticized in some quarters for waiting on the U.S. before committing Canada to specific environmental national goals. But to me, his strategy is just plain common sense. Our two economies and our environment are too closely intertwined and integrated for either country to pass sweeping environmental regs that, in opposition, that are in opposition to the other. We have a long and proud history of working together and reaching consensus. Maroney and Reagan on acid rain, the Migratory Bird Treaty, the Transboundary Water Treaty, NAFTA, Saltfoot Lumber, and the list goes on. Now here in the U.S., in my opinion, the, the political environment in Washington today is much more favorable to Canadian energy than it was even a year ago. And I know, I think David and others have already touched on that somewhat. There's no cap and trade bill pending or out of the House pending in the Senate that would have imposed a green tariff on Canada. There's no threat by the administration to interpret Section 526 of the Energy Independence Act in a way adverse to Canadian oil sands. Rising gas prices and unrest in the Middle East have caused a real concern among Americans that maybe we are too dependent on oil from less than stable and friendly countries, which just makes Canada more important to us. And the budget and deficit battle now going on in Washington. The air is getting sucked out of the room by the debate on budgets and jobs and the economy. Much like the debate over cap and trade and a comprehensive energy policy a little over a year ago was smothered by the debate over national health care uh, in the last Congress. And with the debt ceiling debate and the budget debate for the 2012 fiscal year looming to be dealt with very soon, there's little time or appetite in Congress to tackle major environmental and energy policy. There's a rise in appreciation of the importance of the oil sands uh, in North America uh, for North America's energy security by our elected officials. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham from my home state of uh, South Carolina visited the oil sands last September and declared it a national treasure. Uh, he and Senator Chambliss from um, Georgia returned from their visit and introduced a bill that would, in effect, protect the oil sands from undue burdens that, that are not placed on other oil producers. Add to all this the 2011, I mean, excuse me, 2012 presidential elections. With all the House up for re-election, one-third of the Senate up for re-election, Washington is truly already in an election mode. So I think you have to get beyond the 2012 election before you see the House and the Senate spend real capital, real time, real effort on a comprehensive energy environmental bill. We are at a critical juncture in history, living in a very unstable world, and no one can look at this issue in a political vacuum. As long as we need oil and continue to buy imported crude, it just doesn't make good sense to put up roadblocks to our friend Canada. As much as, we like, as much as we might like to, we can't wish all away. It will be with us for many years to come. And if we make it more difficult for Canadian oil to flow south to us, all it does is empower and enrich less democratic, more, more hostile nations and create a far greater environmental risk in terms of transmission and transportation. 
Thank you all for your interest in our northern neighbor, and I look forward to answering questions with you with other members of the panel. Thank you very much. My name is Chuck Hildenbrand. I'm uh, just a member of the general public interested in this topic, and I appreciate the organizers for opening up to the public, since it can be difficult uh, in, to wade through all the rhetoric in the news and in the media uh, about energy uh, policy. Um, and as was said earlier, I know that a comprehensive uh, energy policy put through Congress anytime soon is probably slim to num none. But let's say Obama came out and said, hey, I charge you Congress with uh, creating an energy policy. I'll let you all duke it out, decide what you want in there, but I want these three things to be a part of it. So I asked uh, the uh, members of the panel, what would be those three things you would most like to see in an energy policy? Okay, I guess I go first. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the first and most important thing is that we reduce our demand through improvements in technology in the automotive sector. That is the single most powerful tool we have. Uh, we did do a very effective piece of legislation in 2007 uh, that over time will reduce about 3 million barrels a day or so of uh, oil demand. Um, but uh, I personally, and I've blogged about this, uh, resent uh, having to attend my tax dollars to bail out GM because they can't produce a car, uh, so I have to buy a Japanese car to get that car mileage when uh, I'm having to bail them out because I won't buy their car because it gets three miles to the gallon. So I would rather see if I'm gonna bail them out, I would rather see them be required to produce a car that maybe got 50 miles to the gallon, even though they say that's not possible. Other car makers can do it, so I figure, you know, we're not that dumb here in the United States, maybe we could do that too. So that would be the single largest thing that we could do. Um, the second thing uh, that I think we need to do is um, we need to have a policy that is unschizophrenic about domestic energy production. Right? So we either have to make a decision, in my opinion, one way or the other. Right? If we're going to have a domestic energy industry, and then we need to regulate it properly. And that means that people who do things that are negligent or illegal need to go to jail. So the first thing I would do if I were President of the United States is go around the country and meet with governors, and I would investigate with sound statistics and not documentary hysteria. Uh, which states have process water dumping problems or processing facility problems and which ones don't. And I would take the head, and I won't say which company, of one or two companies in the industry that are dumping process water in people's backyards, uh, and I would put them in jail, <laughs> right? And after I put them in jail, I would take their company, because they're in jail, but they'll still be a replacement chairman, and I would, I would create a set of laws in the United States that I would apply to both deep water and to shale gas drilling and to, I believe we're going to have to do unconventional oil shale, so let's make a distinction between shale oil and oil shale because people are mixing those two up and it's two different resources. Oil shale is more like the oil sands. I've got some in situ material that's you know close to the surface and I have to produce that. Um, what I would do is I would really make it clear that if you go into an area and you're going to show us that you have the proper technology to develop it in an environmentally, is an environmentally friendly possible way, you know, understanding that production of any energy resource, whether it's coal or nuclear, uh, one might even argue there are environmental downsides to hydro, right? That, that if I'm going to, as a whole environmental movement about kayaking and use of water that wants to take all the hydroelectric plants in the United States offline, so uh, when we evaluate that, then my opinion is the permitting rules need to be that a company that is caught with a certain level of violation loses their permitting rights for a number of years, and we, we the U.S. government, get the permits back. So if we were to decide either through regulatory processes or evaluative processes or through a court of law that we don't want BP to drill anymore in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, there is no current procedure to take those permits back, and they control a high percentage of the current permits in the 
Gulf of Mexico. So I believe that I got what we did with BOMAR and I, BOMRA, and I, I think we did a, uh, the industry did an incredibly good job at quickly coming up with the technology to stop a blowout. Uh, and that changes the picture a little bit. But uh, I still don't think that, so we are all now saying, oh, good, it's regulated, we need to stop. And my opinion would be that when we put the penalty on industry, for not practicing properly at a high enough level. The industry has the capability and the technology to practice in a way that the rest of you in this room would be comfortable with it. And then we need to then have this clear regulation as our path forward so that we don't block every project and every well, well by well and project by project, but we decide what our policy has to be because we know how much domestic resource we can and can't calculate in when we plan our our policy. Um, and then the last thing I would do is I would, um, I would sit down with my friends from Britain and uh, I would tell them that uh, they are not going to develop the financial markets at London at my expense and that we can be friendly and good allies, but futures markets need to be regulated properly. Uh, and we, there's a role for speculators in every market, a positive role, and then there is a role that is beyond positive, uh, and, and market design matters. And we need to get the British to cooperate because if we regulate our futures markets and they don't regulate theirs, all we're gonna do is shift the negative activity uh, to London, and I would get that organized because if I could organize it with the British, then the fact that there's a over-the-counter market or a market in Dubai or a market in Singapore won't matter because the be, the need to offset risk in the large London and New York markets is great enough that if once I had those markets properly regulated, then I could remove some of the volatility that's turned out to be so destructive to our economy and the global economy and the strength and, and uh, uh, stability of the financial system. Okay. You know, it's hard to, to narrow it down to three because we actually need a, a whole suite of energy policy. I mean, we, you know, dealing with electric vehicles, I mean, electric vehicles are wonderful, but you got to figure out, well, where's the electrons coming from? So, I mean, electric vehicles help us, but you have to deal with the, the electricity grid as well. So there's, there's a whole suite of things that need to be done. But in, in thinking about that suite, the, the one thing that keeps coming up, I mean, you, you can't talk to an economist out there who won't tell you a price on carbon is, is probably the very first place you start. I'm not sure it's the, the place that actually gets implemented the first, you know, the first thing that gets implemented, but it doesn't pick winners. It puts a price on a negative environmental attribute that puts that attribute, that impact in the bottom line, and people see that and they make the decisions based on the, the negative impact of that emission. So a, a price on carbon emissions, I think, is, is a no-brainer, and it's not necessarily, you know, cap and trade. There's a lot of ways to put a price. We have incentives. And we actually have a price on carbon in the United States, and it's an incentive for CCS, whether it's an enhanced oil recovery or whether it's a saline aquifer. We actually have a price in the United States for, for um, CCS. Um, so a price on carbon, economy-wide, I think, is a, is a good place to start. But um, negative externalities are not the only market failure that we're facing. We also have um, you know, market failures with, with respect to technology. So there are certain technologies, and the government's not always the best at picking winners in terms of technology. But there are certain technologies that we know are, are important from a political perspective and also from a, a perspective of dealing with <coughs> fuel sources that we know are going to exist. So carbon capture and storage is something I think is really important. Um, it's not going to happen by itself. I mean, we do enhanced oil recovery because it makes sense. But right now, what's being used is naturally occurring CO2. And if we want to actually incentivize um, the, the CO2 that's off the stack and use it for enhanced oil recovery, we're going to have to do something that gives that kind of incentive. Um, and, and there's a, a no-brainer to think about energy efficiency. Everybody loves it. And it's important. But there are market values that keep it from happening. Owner-operator, you know, building owners versus building um, the people who live there, so the owner-operator issue, I mean, that's a failure. So let's figure out how to deal with those market failures. And, and, and the most common way of dealing with that kind of thing is with efficiency standards. And, and we're moving in that direction. You know, all of our appliances have become more efficient over time. But certainly, we can go a lot farther. And I think we should. It's not three, but, but that's many more. Sorry, Jim. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I would, uh, and probably because you've got two economists in a row here, um, 
say you've got to do something about relative prices. So you've got to put a price on carbon. If you really want to overturn the embedded system, you've got to make a financial incentive to do that and turn that then over to the private sector to figure out how it gets done. So that's probably the, the first thing you do. And in some ways, if you don't do that, it may not matter if you do the other stuff. Um, you, you, you may get there, but it'll take a long time with the other stuff. Probably the second thing is on efficiency. I would agree that if we don't tap efficiency and find a way to, to construct the incentives to um, tap efficiency, we're not really doing anything meaningful as well because you have opportunities for very uh, quick payback in terms of efficiency investments that aren't being taken. So we need to understand that and we need to find, figure out what can you do to break through that. And then finally, it's management of the resources that we're using now during the transition. So I think we need to come forward with a um, policies towards development of our own oil and gas resources that are much more proactive. I think it is really, to see the president go down and congratulate the Brazilians on developing their deep offshore and keep most of our offshore off the market is an inconsistency that I think we shouldn't be following through. So we either believe development of the offshore is a good thing or we don't, but let's not just have it politically driven. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think all these ideas are, are valid and should be considered in any meaningful uh, energy environmental debate. I would add to that, and it's not, not original, you just alluded to it, but uh, first I would uh, better utilize the energy assets we now have in the U.S., open up areas that are now off limits, uh, improve conservation technology, uh, which uh, Amy already alluded to, and then uh, getting back to one of my themes in my little talk, uh, better promote and facilitate any energy trade with Canada. Thank you. Uh, Emily, do you? Um, hi, I'm Emily Martin, and I'm a joint um, business and environmental management student. And you all either expressed your support for or alluded to your support for the Keystone Pipeline. And I wanted to ask that if you could explain maybe your thoughts on why you think there has been such objection to this pipeline and at a, a pretty unprecedented level from what I can tell as a, a non-expert in pipelines <coughs> and permitting. Um, and if you think there's any validity to that objection. and if not in objecting to the pipeline, where those concerns could be better directed. I'll start, I guess. I mean, I, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that, that I would express my support. I think it needs to, to be safe, and we need to make sure it's safe. I'm just not sure. Um, but of course, pipelines are safer than, say, barges or maybe even offshore drilling. So I mean, you have to weigh the risks. And I think it's important to consider those risks. And I think people are. Um, but, but I'll give you what I know is the opposition. One is that we got a lot of capacity in the pipelines that currently exist, so why do we need another pipeline that adds risk to our, our framework? That's one of the, the concerns. Um, I truthfully know that we have excess capacity, but I don't know that we have enough excess capacity to handle all of the, the energy supply that we're going to need in this country. So that, that's one issue is excess capacity that currently exists. The second is simply pipeline leaks. Um, you know, bitumen is heavier. Certainly it's diluted. But if it is more corrosive, it poses a greater challenge to the, the, the safety of a pipeline. And that, again, that needs to be solved. So, so bitumen is more corrosive. Um, and where it's coming through, it's coming through some, some sensitive areas like the Ogallala Aquifer that provides a significant amount of, of, of water to um, to communities, so if there's leaks, it would have implications, um, significant implications to the people who live around there. Um, anybody else have other, why there is other? Yeah, but, um, I think from the point of view of whether it was supported, I think it's an infrastructure uh, project that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's feeding into a part of the U.S. refining system that needs replacement oil, and it's bringing it and actually relieving pressure within, as an allusion this morning, in, in technical terms, to an oversupply in uh, uh, the Cushing, Oklahoma market. It will actually help to do that, pull the plug on the oil that's um, stopped up there, and provides access from new development coming in um, in, the, in the Bakken oil shale. So I, th I think from that point of view, it makes a lot of sense as an investment. And it is a private sector investment, so they made a commercial decision that this made sense, and they have support. I think the strength of the opposition, as I was alluding to in my talk, uh, was that 
with the failure of the effort on comprehensive um, uh, legislation, a lot of that energy, so to speak, had to go someplace else. The pr presidential permit process gave an opportunity and a forum for directing that into that. So what had taken previous uh, presidential permits, which had opposition, took them from this lower level of opposition that very rarely got press and concentrated it into that, into a very well-organized campaign. Uh, I support the pipeline. I think it's uh, going on. David Goldman could ask this better than any of us, probably, but I think it's well into its third year now of, of, of waiting for a decision. I think we ought to use our due diligence. We ought to make improvements, as he alluded to in his uh, luncheon speech. But at some point in time, we've got to give an answer. Uh, oil sand is going to be developed. It's whether we get the oil or somebody else gets it. And uh, I think it makes sense for us to get it. I, I believe I'm correct in saying there was a recent U.S. Energy Department report uh, found that the approval of the, the Keystone Pipeline would actually lower demand for Middle East oil. It certainly seems logical to me, and I think I'm correct in, in citing the U.S. Um, Energy Department with, with the, being the author of that report. So, so I'd just like to throw out two very different ideas. Uh, the first one is that the very same people, or maybe some of the same people, and including the president, who are against the Keystone Pipeline on, on environmental grounds advocate strongly for the use of biofuels in the United States, which is incredibly environmentally detrimental. We are pouring thousands and thousands of tons, millions of tons of fertilizer waste into the Mississippi River, creating a dead zone at the end of the Mississippi River that makes the BP oil spill look like a blip. And nobody says anything about it. Nobody goes to protest against it. Right? People actually say that biofuels are carbon neutral, but that has actually been found untrue by the U.S. scientific community. Right? They're actually carbon positive. Right? And we take ethanol uh, and we ship it around with truck so that we use oil to move it around to replace 2% of the U.S. gasoline supply, but arguably we're probably using even more than that. And you and I, the taxpayer, are paying a, a tax that works out to $2.75 a gallon to add that ethanol into your gasoline supply and the money goes, 20% of the money goes to Valero, a Texas-based oil refiner. It's not going to some family farm in Ohio, right, or Indiana. It's going to Valero Refining. Now, I like the guys at Valero Refining because I'm a Texan and I do visit them when I go to San Antonio, but they don't need my tax dollars. Right? So the environmental debate in this country is completely unfocused. It advocates for things that cause the same amount of environmental destruction and advocates against things where it had, there's, you know, arguably some environmental issues, right? But it's very selective and on things that it decides it likes, then the environmental destruction doesn't matter. And on things it decides it doesn't like, then we just are in the media all the time on the environmental destruction. Right? So what I would say about the Keystone Pipeline as my last point, right, is that that oil will not necessarily remain in the ground. If it's in Canada's interest to produce it, somebody in Canada with more political leverage will find a route out to the west and that oil will go to China. And it'll go to China. So all the people who don't want the pipeline to spill and they don't want the emissions from the oil sands and all those things they don't want, all those things are going to happen anyway and the oil is going to go to China. And we'll buy oil from someplace else that has some other dirty consequence. We'll buy it from Nigeria where people just take the processed water and dump it into people's backyards and cause people to get all kinds of illnesses and hardships. Right, and then shoot each other over and shoot oil company executives because of the environmental, severe environmental damage. So, you know, when you get in your car, what I have to say to you, the younger generation, is when you get in your car and you do not demand that your car get 50 miles to the gallon, and you are not going to take the bus, you're on a campus where you all drive by car, right? When you do that, and you say to yourself, I don't care that the pollution is being made in Nigeria because that's not my country. So I'm not going to let the pollution be made here. I'm going to import the oil that I'm using in my car so that the pollution is made somewhere else. That is not a sensible policy. That is not an environmentally friendly policy. That is not an emissions-free policy. If you're not actually using the energy, 
if you are doing the same activity and using less energy, that is a pro anti-emissions policy. That is where we want to be moving. We don't want to be moving to a policy where we get to use the same amount of energy and have the pollution be in somebody else's country, right? We want to move to a policy where we, the United States, who have 5% of the world's population and use 34%, did you hear me, 34% of all road transportation fuel made in the world, you know, that's us. So one last statistic for you, because I spend a lot of time on these statistics, because I used to have a joint venture with the AAA to try to get people to think about it, <laughs> right? When President Bush was president, he stood up and he said that his goal was by 2017, we should lower gasoline use in this country and oil imports by 20%. And somebody asked me the question, a good student like yourselves asked me the question, you know, can't we do that through conservation? And so we have an energy economist at Rice, Ken Metlock, who's very good on what we call the rebound effect, because you can't just multiply the number of cars by the amount of oil used, because when your car gets better mileage, unfortunately, you drive a little more. So the arithmetic is a little more sophisticated. But the bottom line is, if everyone in America drove 35 miles less per week, that's the 20%. I mean, that is a small burden on people. Just 20% right there off the top of your head. If you just, you and everybody else like you went onto Facebook and talked everybody into thinking about reducing 35 miles a week, one day telecommuting, one day taking the bus, one day carpooling, one day taking the train, we could get 20% off of demand overnight by just deciding to do it. One last question. Right. So tying off of Amy's last point, oh, my name's Kent Trucor. I'm a dual degree here uh, with the Business School and the Environmental School, and I appreciate you folks coming out to talk to us today. Uh, tying off of Amy's point, and something that I'm really curious about, I'm sure a lot of other people are, uh, numerous times at these conferences that regard energy, the, the issue of a national policy comes up and how much industry and other interests would like to have a national policy. However, uh, markets are driven by demand, by consumers. Uh, politicians are reelected by people. So it seems like people will be the ones who will drive any of this forward. How do you coalesce uh, this nation, or how do you see it going about so that national policy could potentially move forward? Because it's, it's dead at this point, and we've been fighting 40 years for it. Well, I guess what I would say um, on the energy side uh, and eventually climate will come into it. Uh, when we start to have a real energy debate, then you have to have a climate debate go with it. Um, is that, uh, here's the bottom line. I showed you the chart about the 21 million barrels a day that's in countries where the population in those countries are unhappy with either their level of sharing in the revenue from the oil, their level of political participation, or the equality at which certain groups and other groups in that society are treated. And there'll be a day when you wake up and flip on Anderson Cooper, and he won't be talking about the one million barrels a day from Libya. He's gonna be talking about a bigger country with more oil, and then you're not gonna actually be able to get to Duke. And when you can't get to Duke, really can't get to Duke, because you kids are too young, to, all, all you can do is watch a documentary about what happened in the 1970s, <laughs> right? When you actually can't get to Duke, and I have to come up with a system to give you a rationing card, because you won't actually stop driving that 35 miles per week, um, then you'll demand an energy policy. I, um, I think that's interesting. My, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't really believe in altruism. I mean, I think we, we have, to, we have to, to do things that are right, but I also believe in the power of the market. So, I mean, people need to see a, a value in, in taking action, and, and certainly there is a value in turning off your light switch, but people don't always make that connection. You turn off electricity, you, know, you turn off the light switch and your electricity rates go down. But I think we need to make that transparent. So I think it comes back to actually, I hate to say this, but it's, it's education, communication, hearts and minds, making people understand that this is an issue, that, uh, that there are risks, and talking about those risks. Because we actually have a history in this country of dealing with risks fairly well. But, but right now, those risks aren't transparent, and people really don't understand them, and I think we need to be clearer about the risks 
on our energy and on the climate. Because you, it's not just an energy security. Because if you just deal with energy security, there are things that you could do, like um, fisher trope technology, uh, coal to liquids, that's good for energy security, but really, really bad for the climate. So we need to make sure that we're doing this in harmony. We need to, to keep that in mind, and we need to educate the, the populace on um, you know, just what the risks are. And, and it's going to take a while. It's not something we're going to do overnight. As I mentioned, I worked about uh, 30 years in the, uh, the energy policy field and heard the whole time about the fact that we don't have comprehensive energy policy. And I think the reality is it's not something you're ever going to get. And I think that, that Janet mentioned that, is you've got policies in many different areas that are going on here that you have to balance out. So it's constantly a balancing process. So usually when someone is telling you they don't, we don't have a national energy policy is because it's not the one that they want to fit their particular needs. And we have to keep searching for doing the right kind of balancing, but that balancing shifts over time. Um, I do think, though, the one thing we can't do is pretend that we can change the trajectory of our energy system without spending any money. And that it seems to be, I, I coined it uh, after I left government, as sort of a faith-based energy policy that, you know, we'll have faith and we'll get through it and we'll um, do all these things. It's going to be costly and it's going to take time because you have evolved a very efficient um, energy system. The, the reason we use gasoline in our cars is it's a tremendously, uh, what's the right word here? It, it's the best way that anyone's devised to taking a little bit of energy, a small container, and you can drive a long ways with it. You start moving away from that point and it's, it doesn't work as well. And you give up range, you give up uh, refueling time, all sorts of things. And so there are costs to making the transition and you have to be willing to say, Yes, I will pay more. I agree completely. Like I said, you got two economists in a row that you got to set the prices right, and then the the you will have the right kind of investments being made and the right kind of choices being made. And I think that's what we'll have to do. And until we do that, I think we'll be searching for this energy policy for until you get to be my age. I, I should say, uh, I should say, just ditto. I think if you polled Americans today, they they uh, be a high number that would say we want a comprehensive. A national energy policy, uh, not state by state. Uh, California going one direction, somebody else going another, be fragmented. But a national energy policy. The problem is, I want my version of the national energy policy. You want your version of it. Sort of like let's compromise and do it my way, right? <laughs> and, and so, therein lies the problem. And and until the public demands it, the specifics of of an energy policy puts enough pressure on elected officials. And I. Having been there, I know we respond eventually. Um, it won't happen. I'm just going to conclude. For pressing note, Dan. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, so let, me, let me conclude with my own last question, and that is, is that it, at lunch and, and in our brochure, we talk about the fact that um, the U.S. and Canada have an opportunity to work together to um, develop a, a, a kind of leading relationship uh, on uh, energy and environment and um, one that might be able to set a standard for, for the world. Um, we, we've heard from Ambassador Wilkins that it's, it's unlikely that anything's going to happen here in the United States after 2012, <coughs> and, and he made the very important point that um, whatever one country does, they need to, because of our close ties, um, it, it needs to work for the other country. So I guess my concluding question for you all is, is there an area um, in, in the kind of climate energy space that the U.S. and Canada um, could lead on and, and really make a significant um, uh, environmental impact as well as a leadership uh, position. So I would I guess I would mirror what David said because it really gets to the crux of it and I have this very sarcastic way I illustrate it so my apologies to people who think that I've attacked the president too many times today. When you make a speech about what you intend to do if you made it, if John F. Kennedy made a speech about how we intend to go to the moon and he allocated $70 million to do it, we would never have gone to the moon, we would not have had a space program, and we would be a joke as a country, right? So $70 million is how much, well, maybe it's a little more now, maybe it's $130 million. We spend on solar energy research in the federal government, right? So, you know, we have this rhetorical position, and, um, I think David really hit the nail on the head. We're not willing to spend any money on it. And there are many ways you could do it. You could price 
carbon. Or you could simply just say, you know, tomorrow, you're all used to having the price of gasoline go up and down, and we don't care that it's regressive. We'll fix that with the income tax system. Here's the new gasoline tax. You're going to have a chance to buy a new car because we're going to implement it over a 10-year period. It's going to phase up over 10 years. And all of you, on average, buy a new car every seven years. So, you know, take it into account because when we get to the year of 20, you know, 21, the gasoline tax is going to be a dollar higher. Right, and then you know all the things that everybody else on the panel has talked about would kick in, right? Because in the end, gasoline is a very efficient fuel, but in today's price, I mean, I'm a little off because you know the price moves around. <coughs> At three dollar gasoline and and uh, ten cent retail electricity, it's two cents a mile to have an electric car, and it's seventeen cents a mile to fill your car with gasoline. So the economics are there if the technology was there. The technology is not going to be there unless we do strong R&D and give incentives to companies that do strong R&D, and that's going to cost us something. You know, I, I have to say that the, the markets are wonderful, and you know, being a, a, a true-blooded economist, I mean, we, you have to have it. As, there has to be an incentives for to get people's attention, but um, but you also have to have policy. I mean, I don't know what the right policy is, whether that's, I mean, I prefer a price. Um, I also think that, you know, carbon capture and storage is, is of interest on both sides of the border. Um, so moving that technology is going to take money. But it also takes policy. I mean, you can spend all the money you want on incentives for technology, but if there's no reason to pull it off the shelf and use it, it's wasted money. So you have to give people a reason to use the technology. I mean, you have to push and pull technology, and I think you can do that on both sides of the border. I think the obvious things are continuing the, the kind of research, uh, Amy had referred to CCS, but you also have other energy research projects that both countries fund, and so you can collaborate in that area. But I think the more fundamental uh, commitment that's been made and needs to be made all the time is the commitment to allowing the market to operate um, as, as fully as possible in terms of the decision making and having structures and rules that will reflect um, co sort of common interests. And so I think we need to have that dialogue to talk about how do we approach environmental issues, how do we do this. Uh, I mean, I would say, having done this for a long time, there's a difference between having a U.S.-Canada dialogue and a Canada-Canada a, a dialogue. So the, the provincial discussion is probably as important as the U.S.-Canada, just like our state discussion is important. So we have a, it's a multi-vector uh, discussion, but I think that's what we need to do is to try to bring this concept of are we approaching this in the same way? Are we allowing sort of the market to, to work this out within the parameters that we've decided we need to set with the policies? I think it's realistic to hope for a comprehensive North American energy policy, but not until the year 2013. <laughs> well, thank you. Join me in thanking the panel. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.